you think? We, we've been trying to read the tea leaves here for a long time. What, what's your best guess about where we stand? If I can make one general point, I've never seen a period where we have 360 degree trade negotiations with China and Japan, with Europe, with Mexico, Canada, all going at the same time. It's the most tra active trade agenda I've seen in, in decades. I think with China, uh, the report was very accurate. Um, progress was made in Beijing. I think progress will be made next week in Washington when Leo He comes. But ultimately, we know that this was going to be a deal that could only be reached at the presidential level. I think that will happen in late May or early June in the United States. But that still means that it could go either direction if this is really comes down to the decision between two men. And those two men have not really weighed in on what we have so far. I think they've given clear indications to their negotiators, but they have not weighed in. That is typical uh, for deal making. You want to hold your cards close right to that very uh, last point. Uh, but I think the consistency of the statement about the progress and the productivity suggests to me it's moving the right direction. Hmm. But, but let's be clear. Uh, this will be a deal, but we are engaged in what will be a decades-long competition with China. Sure not unlike what we went through with the Soviet Union in a political military context, this will now be more economic financial. So I think this is an important step, but on a long, long path of competition between the U.S. and China. Kind of setting the rules for a Cold War, so to speak? Um, I wouldn't go so far as to talk about Cold War. Having served in a hot war, I prefer no war. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is China's been very clear. Made in China 2025, China 2050. They have made clear their aspiration <clears throat> to be the dominant country in the world, certainly in economic and financial terms. Look, we're pretty good at competing, but people have to play by the rules. And I think these trade negotiations help both set and reinforce the rules of the road. And the Chinese have not been following those to this point. You think it's a good thing or a bad thing that we are involved in so many trade negotiations at the same time? It, it, kind of a new paradigm. I think it's a good thing, and I think it could have been predicted. My own view is President Trump won the election in 2016 because, because he was pitch perfect on trade in his message to the Rust Belt states. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to move out on these. And he did right away renegotiation of the Korean agreement, backing out of TPP, backing out of NAFTA, but quickly negotiating the Mexico-Canada agreement. And China, of course, he said, was the top priority. So I think he's following through on a campaign pledge. Um, I think it's a tough time to work at the Trade Representative's office. Bob Lighthizer's an old friend going back to the Reagan years. That is a tremendous pace of activity going on right now. But I think it's a good thing because we have, I think, a common set of rules against which we're trying to measure all these negotiations. Well, maybe in some ways. I, I mean, it does seem that some progress they've made in some negotiations have probably helped them in some of their other negotiations or, or some, some tough love that they've laid down or has maybe benefited them as well. All trade negotiators watch what happens in other negotiations. There's the MFN, most favored nation clause, sure. that you never give to somebody something you're not prepared to give to somebody else. So you're right. We have to look at the precedent being set. But actually, I like the direction right now that it's more results-oriented than rhetoric-oriented, and we need results look, in the trade area. We, we think we've dealt with new NAFTA, with that new agreement. It, it's been signed off by the three countries, but it still has to get approval from the legislature. And right now, Nancy Pelosi is saying she's not going to bring that to, a, to the floor for a vote unless she gets some additional things that Democrats want in that. That's, that concerns me a little. How, how likely is it that this is going to get passed? Um, very good question. I think it is now very much a political question. Uh, remember, the Democrats didn't love NAFTA. Yeah. Um, and I think the renegotiation turned out a better deal. There might be some concerns on the part of the Democrats on labor standards in Latin America, things of that sort. Not getting as much as they wanted in right. the deal. Right. But let's be particular and let's try to find the way to get that result because I do think that a redefined NAFTA is going to be good for all workers, including in states that will be important for both Democrats and Republicans next year. Because of the rules of, of origin changes that, that really do benefit the United well, States. Well, and rules of origin, uh, domestic content. Domestic take, content for how much Right, it's gone, exactly, right. Is, is really important. But let me tell you, this isn't only the U.S. that goes through this. The European High Court just yesterday approved the Canada EU trade deal that was negotiated about six years ago. And you may recall it was held up for a year and a half because the Wallonians in Belgium 
weren't happy with it, okay? So multilateral deals are really tough. Domestic politics play not just in the U.S. but abroad. So what, what, what's your best guess as to what we're going to get with this Chinese trade deal, with something that comes out of it or doesn't? You're saying late May, but you think we'll really know the answer? I think we will. I think you're going to see uh, better access to certain sectors in China. I think you're going to see more purchases of U.S. products. Uh, there's also, importantly, and I think this is the final sticking point in the negotiation, going to be an enforcement mechanism on making sure that people live up to agreements. Uh, that has been absent in the past. The Chinese pushed very hard, but the U.S. said it won't go forward without that enforcement mechanism. Unfortunately, one of the more recent uh, bits of news I've heard out of this is that enforcement me mechanism is, not, is going to be bilateral, not just unilateral, that we won't be the only ones who get to use it, that China will get to use it as well, and that U.S. companies are very concerned about that, being you know, left to the whims of what they don't see as a fair trading partner. Um, I think you only expect in a bilateral trade deal there there be symmetry on the enforcement side. So is but this yes, something the, we really want or not? Well, I, I think we do want an enforcement mechanism, but the U.S. government has to make sure not only that we enforce what the Chinese do in the United States, but the Chinese are fair on how they enforce it in China. I don't understand how that works in this mechanism, at least as it's been described to me. Um, I don't know all the details on the mechanism, but what I know is the Chinese in the past were very good at making pledges. They're really terrific on rhetoric. But then when it came time to hold them to the agreement, they would start to meander, including on this whole question of using cyber against U.S. commercial interests. Right. There was a deal struck between Xi and Obama in 2015 on that issue, and yet it's gone nowhere. And so I think we've got to have that enforcement mechanism, but you're right, it's like the investor uh, dispute mechanism that you see in many agreements. The U.S. has to be careful that things that it needs on its side are not used against its companies abroad.